Revelation again. Revelation. Now, what I want to do is review. Can we do that? Um, I am always reminded of how quickly I forget. And again, Satan, of all the things he would like me to forget, is what I learned from the Word of God. Last week, we learned that the Greek word rendered revelation means unveiling. It is an awesome thing. It's God's desire is not to conceal, but to reveal. It's not a book to be feared, but rather to be embraced. We were introduced to Jesus Christ not as he was, but as he is. That will come again today. No longer on a cross, but on a throne. We also learned its purpose is, yes, to describe divine judgment for those who've rejected Christ. And that's typically what people think it's all about, but it's not. It's also to show those who profess their faith in Christ that the best is yet to come. That is horrible and is corrupt. It gets on this planet. This is not all there is. Rest and joy. And a reunion with our loved ones who passed on before us. Can you picture that? Revelation is not merely to communicate information or arouse curiosity about all those things we tend to think about. The Antichrist, the number of the beast, and so forth and so on. And, but also, like the rest of the Bible, to transform our behavior as we learn more about Jesus and what must take place before he returns. And then finally, we learn Jesus is the faithful witness. He never fails. He is the consummate man of his word. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. Yet Kim Jong-un, uh, Jong uh, is that his name? North Korea? And Vladimir Putin meet these this past week. I'm sure those guys feel like they rule. But they don't rule. There's a king who's coming. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last Greek letters of their alphabet, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And I reminded you of what that 20th century preacher A.W. Tozer said, when it, while it looks like things are out of control, behind the scenes there is a God who hasn't surrendered his throne. And all God's people said, Amen. Yeah, we're going to see that again as we get into cha uh, chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. We'll finish chapter 1 today. So, in verse 1, let me just say this in introduction of the text. Uh, God sets up a, 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 a full chain of agents. It's from God the Father to Jesus Christ to an angel to John. Don't get caught up in that. Don't let that distract you. It says, The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, what must soon take place. In other words, these things will happen. Nothing can stop them. He, God, made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. God used, has used angels throughout Scripture. Daniel, Mary, to just name a few. To John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is the Word of God, and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So there are times when God uses an angel who appears to John. There are times when John sees the Lord himself. But Jesus Christ is the primary revealer as the vision of 1, 9 through 20 shows. Most of what John receives throughout the book is in the form of visions. Don't get caught up in that either. We'll talk more about this when we get to chapter 4, verse 1. There is a supernatural realm, what we call the metaphysical. Those who would scoff at that, I scoff at them because they can no more prove there's not one than I can prove there is one. What we do, we look at the evidence, and I can promise you folks, of course the Bible speaks of it over and over again into the spirit realm which is the true reality. It is there. I can assure you of that. So let's unpack the text today. We get to Revelation 1, verse 9. John, I, John, your brother and your companion or partner in the tribulation or suffering, 
and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. John identifies himself as the author four times. There's no doubt. In verse 1 of chapter 1, in verse 4, in verse 9, and then at the end in chapter 22, verse 8. By this time, some 96 A.D., all of the disciples, as well as Paul, have been put to death by the Roman government. John is the only one of the original disciples left. He is in his mid-90s. Eusebius, the 4th century historian, Greek historian, who at this was also a Christian, he records in his book of church history that Rome had already tried to put John to death, but somehow John escaped. God wasn't through with John. I have a friend who had, uh, I don't know how many blood clots in his lungs a couple of weeks ago. He was told by, I think, three doctors, I can't believe you're here. You should not be here. You should have died. Yeah. Yeah. Well, David Lowe, he was in our, he's in our class. He hasn't been able to come due to his health. But, and Michelle and I just told his family, <laughs> clearly, God isn't through with you. Our days are numbered. We can't add one day to it. We can't add, take away one day from it. And so it's interesting because he begins to describe, number one, he's a partner in tribulation. This is the first feature of their shared reality as Christians, is in the tribulation or affliction or distress. That's interesting because it was a, it was a hard time that first century. Now, in the 21st century, you go around the world to North Korea, Russia, uh, Arab countries ruled hardline by Sharia law. It's just as bad there. They're being killed. They're being beheaded and persecuted. Their jobs taken away just because, just because they profess their faith in Christ. So folks, it's coming here one day. I can promise you that. There's something comforting and empowering about knowing you're not alone. John's telling the people, he said, look, I'm with you, man. In, in Peter's first letter, 1 Peter verses, uh, chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. Now, you know verse 8, don't be deceived. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around you like a roaring lion, seeking someone not to trip up or to nibble on, but to devour. He wants the Christian out of the game. And then right after that, Peter says, but resist him. Standing firm in your faith, man. Don't let him. He, he can't hurt us. All he can do to a Christian is try to weaken our faith. Our soul is off the market. And then Peter goes on. He says, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. You just think of one of the worst crises you have ever been through in your life. And people come and they comfort you and you're grateful for that. But then you meet someone who's been through the same thing and has survived. There's just something about knowing someone who's been through what you've been through and has lived to talk about it. It gives you great hope. And so that's what John is communicating here. This is that side of the gospel that we rarely hear preached. Uh, Paul told uh, Timothy in... Uh, 1 Timothy 2, 3, suffer with me like a good soldier in Christ Jesus. Now, the emphasis is not on, hey, let's all suffer together. In fact, <clears throat> Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, in everything give thanks. Not for everything give thanks. But in that furnace, remember that Jesus is there. And that's what we thank God for. That we are never left alone. Consider David's words in uh, Psalm 38. Now, David brought a lot of pain on himself, but nothing in the context indicates that's the case here. He said, but my foes are vigorous. They are mighty, and many are those who hate me wrongfully. He stood up for what he believed in. Those who render me evil for good accuse me because I follow after good. You ever been made fun of or mocked? I have. I have. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, of my salvation. That is, doesn't even begin to express the Hebrew imagery behind his 
crying out and pleading to God as he is he's just beat down but David also wrote many evils or hardships or afflictions confront the righteous but the Lord rescues them from them what all he's in the furnace with you man John 16 33 Jesus made no bones about it he said I've told you these things my friends this is in the upper room the night before he'd be crucified, so that in me you may have what? Peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Now that's interesting because he's already speaking in past tense. The cross would be the next day. But he said, man, although you're going to see it demonstrated in front of you tomorrow, I'm king already. So every worldview, don't ever forget this, the number one argument for atheism is the problem of pain. How could a God who claims to be good and loving allow such pain? Well, we're the ones who messed it up in Eden. I personally want to thank Adam and Eve when I get there. I thank you all so much. This has been wonderful. Every worldview has its problem of pain. Atheism, agnosticism, naturalism, scientism, you just pick your ism. Only the biblical worldview offers hope and peace. Only the biblical worldview, purpose in your pain, hope in your pain. So never let someone try to corner you by saying, yeah, how could a good God? Well, okay, you don't have to believe in God, but what do you do with your pain, man? At least I have hope and I have purpose. And I know things always won't be this way. Why? Because he did do something. He did care. He did do something about it 20 centuries ago on a cross outside of Jerusalem. That's my king. That's my shepherd. So we continue. He's on an island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Where is Patmos? It's just outside Tohoka. <laughs> <coughs> it's way outside Tohoka. Now, what I tried to do at the top of the picture there, I drew a little red arrow. That's Ephesus. Um, that is, uh, Ephesus there is, you don't see all of it, but that's Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, okay? Right below that arrow, you see the word Patmos. I tried to circle that with a, with a little circle. I just want you to know, man, this is a real island. This is uh, not something made up that they've not discovered uh, since biblical times. Now, I want you to know something also. Regardless of Rome's reasons for placing John there, we know that it was because of the Word of God and his testimony. But God, who is ultimately in control, put John there to receive this. Now, this is a good reminder. These are your next blanks. We can be in the darkest of situations and be right where God has led us. So... He can have our undivided attention in order to tell us great and hidden things that you have not known. Jeremiah 33.3. We used to call that in youth ministry God's phone number, J-E-R-333. Now, I know that's only six numbers, but you know what I'm talking about. He says, call to me, and I will show you great and hidden things that you have not known. So regardless of how it may appear, the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. Don't resist it, man. Lean into it. God has put us there. It, it may be a job right now that you are miserable in. Don't resist it, man. It's not like God stepped out and came back and said, Oh, I, that's, I didn't mean for you to take that job. He's always intimately acquainted with our ways. And he put us there. Matthew 4, verse 1. The wilderness, temptation, narratives. Don't ever forget. You should find it and highlight it. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I had a student. I've shared this before. And they came back. They were in high school. They had just started school. They're kind of like right now. They were frantic, panicked, anxious because they were... Now in a class, they were the only Christian in that class. Not only were the others not Christians, they were pretty, pretty rough. I looked at that student and I went, that is awesome. God chose you to bear that light. 
you lean into that class. You be Jesus to those people. Sometimes God may just be convicting you to do something you just won't want to do. Lean into it. Sometimes it may be silence. I don't know that there's anything harder in the Christian life than waiting on God. Hurry up. Hurry up. Heal my loved one. Give me direction on which decision. You, you, there's a text. Maybe that's God. You know, and by the way, God did text us. It's in here. But we're waiting on God. This uh, quote by Oswald Chambers from his, uh, my utmost for his highest. His silence is the sign that he is bringing you into an even more wonderful understanding of himself. Listen, John hasn't just arrived on Patmos. There's no telling how much time had come, had transpired before God opened up the sky. He said, when you cannot hear God, you will find that he has trusted you in the most intimate way possible with absolute silence. Not a silence of despair, but one of pleasure because he saw that you could withstand an even bigger revelation. So if God has given you silence, then praise him. He's bringing you into the mainstream of his purposes. Or maybe you've been nose to the grindstone, man. You're exhausted. You just meet yourself coming and going, burning the candle at both ends. And you're just falling into that proverbial rabbit hole that we see in Alice in Wonderland. Well, sometimes God will use Pain and suffering and tribulation, right? C.S. Lewis. Oh, I went the wrong way, didn't I? There you go. C.S. Lewis and his uh, The Problem of Pain said we can ignore even pleasure, right? Good things, we can kind of just even ignore that. But pain insists on being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone. To rouse a deaf world. Again, God's going to put you wherever he wants you so that he can reveal great and hidden things to you. So don't resist it. Lean into it hard. So let's move on. Verses 10 and 11. Paul said, I was in the spirit. He was, he was, he was uh, caught up into something. We're not sure. I don't think he disappeared from Patmos. But God opened up the spirit realm to him on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, not the one where the eagles play, and to Laodicea. The Lord's day was Sunday, and the voice was a commanding voice. Now, prior to the resurrection, Sabbath was Saturday. That's the day they honored as a day where they were just still and they did their thing. And <clears throat> I mean, they weren't always motionless. But that was a day set aside to focus on the Lord. Well, that changed after the resurrection. In Acts 27, it says, On the first day of the week when they were gathered together to break bread. So... This refers to Sunday, the day that had become the icon for the Christian faith since Jesus rose again on a Sunday. I don't think that's by accident that John is receiving this revelation on the Lord's day because it was on the Lord's day that Jesus rose from the dead. Not by accident. Jesus is teaching a message Inside a message, inside a message. So it's these little phrases, man, that we can't, we can't uh, skip over. This is not just a day. Jesus said, this is the day, man. I'm the one who rose from the dead, and you're looking at the one who rose from the dead. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. You guys who play in the orchestra, some of you have trumpets right behind you. <clears throat> it's like an air horn or a semi-truck that's blowing their horn, man. You're, you're not going to miss it. It's, in other words, it's saying, listen, I know that you see this. I've seen, sometimes we'll watch that show Cops, you know, and, and the, 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 the car that they're stopping just won't stop. And they finally pull over, 
And they say, oh, I didn't, I didn't see you. And the cop will look at them and say, you, you didn't see the five billion watt lights on top of my car? You didn't hear the siren? Of course they did. They just ignored it. Now there's going to be no ignoring in this passage. And he said, write what you see. So this is the first of 12 commands in the book of Revelation for John to write what he saw. Now it's of significance that in 10, chapter 10, verse 4, he was forbidden to write what he saw. Just like Daniel, when God said, these things are to be sealed up until the proper time. And then he says to send it to all of these churches. We'll look more at these churches as well as their significance next week when we begin chapter 2. So let's move on. Verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. Now, some things we have to do our best to interpret through the context of Scripture. This, we don't. Because in verse 20, Jesus says the lampstands are the seven churches. So Jesus himself interprets this imagery for us. Now, whether this was the menorah, the Hebrew menorah, Jewish menorah, or seven separate lampstands, we don't know, and it doesn't matter. But we do know this. John did not call them lamps. He called them lampstands. Now, these are the churches. These represent the modern contemporary church. A lamp itself does not possess the capacity to shine, but it bears that which is capable of illumination. The churches are therefore called lampstands, not lights. Irenaeus, the second century church father, said the lampstands are the church which bear the light of Christ to the world. There are some churches you walk in, you ever walk to those, walked into those? They're just dead. It's like... I, you could skate down the aisles, man. There's, there's just no life. That's because that lampstand has somehow dimmed the light or threw the light outside altogether, as we see in the church at Laodicea. They've lost their first love. We'll see all this demonstrated in the next couple of weeks when we look at the letters to the seven churches. Now, this phrase gives me tremendous comfort. And in the midst of the lampstands, we'll talk about more of that in a minute, but keep that in mind. In the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. In chapter 2, verse 1, these words are of him who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Folks, Jesus is here. He walks among the, the, the seven lampstands or what? The church. Amidst the church, Jesus walks. You may sit in church. There's a seat no one sitting in next to you. Don't believe that. Jesus is there, man. He is, he is among us. So the reason South Crest, I believe, and I've talked to David about this often, that you walk in and it's just alive. Jesus is lifted high here, man. The Bible is taught and preached unapologetically. It's alive. And so Jesus is free to be in our midst in a powerful way. It's awesome. Absolutely incredible. So in the midst is one like the Son of Man. Now look at the parallel in Daniel 7, 13. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. This is the name Jesus used for himself more than any other. It's used 83 times in the Gospels, always by Jesus himself. Why is that? It's because when he says son of man, it's representative of his humanity on earth. It's his humanity on display. We do a great job of reading the Gospels and saying, this is Jesus, he's God. But he was also 100% human. 100% God, 100% human, not 50-50. Don't try to wrap your mind around that. It's what theologians call the hypostatic union. It's the incarnation of God himself. Oh, I, I, my brain, it's, it's hurting, breaking down. I need the pharmacy. 
There's no way we can comprehend it. It is beyond our capacity. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We experience both. He modeled that for us. So what happened was we as humans blew the covenant. We didn't keep our end of the bargain. We broke the contract as far as living a perfect life so that in righteousness we could have eternal life. We blew it. No way. The, the purpose of the Old Testament law, the 613 Levitical laws, was not to save us, but to show us how sinful we are. There's no way. The New Testament, Paul talks about that often. And so the, only a human could satisfy our side of the covenant. We can't do it. Who's going to do it? <laughs> Enter Jesus Christ who, although 100% human, tempted in all things, did not sin. Don't minimize that ever. Don't minimize that. 100% human, tempted in all things. You think about those things you blew yesterday. Not much, not much less all week long or this year. Jesus tempted the same way in all things. He, he met the devil head on in uh, Matthew 4 and Luke 4 said, no, sir, not today. What did he do? He quoted scripture. Man, those things in your life that you're dealing with, you find your scripture, you write them on a card, old school, put them on your bathroom uh, mirror, put them in your car, anywhere, or on your computer, guys, if you got a problem with going to www.ishouldn'tbehere.com. You know what I'm talking about. And so what did Jesus do? Well, we're told in John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Philippians, Paul wrote, he said, he was being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The author of Hebrews put it this way. He says, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die and only by dying. Could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death? Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Now, there are some who've never professed their faith in Christ and say, I don't, I'm not afraid of dying. You should be. You should be. It was Albert Camus, the, 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 the 20th century French philosopher, atheist, even he said, I would rather live my life as a Christian only to find out God doesn't exist when I die than to live as an atheist only to find out he does. He also, moving on, a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. Now, why am I stopping at every single phrase? Because I want you to learn every single thing. So, this is reminiscent in the Old Testament for the high priest, the garb, the clothing the high priest would, would wear. Now, Jesus is our high priest. The author of Hebrews said, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. At the moment of Jesus' death, man, when, as a visual aid, God ripped that veil in half from top to bottom. No longer at that moment did anyone have to go through a Levitical priest. We now have direct access to God. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, though once you were far away, you've now been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. We don't pray to the saints. There's no saint to pray to. Interesting. When the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. Man, you, you pray. We've never heard anyone pray like you. We've heard the Pharisees. It's mechanical. Uh, you're so intimate. Here's what he said. When you pray, say, Father in heaven. He didn't say, go get a priest. Uh, Stephen, in Acts 7, when he was executed for his faith by the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders, Right before he took his last breath, he looked up at heaven and he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He did not say, guys, hold the rocks for a minute. Find me a priest so I can pray, man. Paul put it this way. 
He said, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Moving on, verses 14 and 15. I want you to see the parallels between this passage and Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. John wrote, the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. Look what Daniel described in Daniel 7 verse 9. I kept looking until thrones were set up. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His garment was white as snow. And the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was flames of fire. It is of no small significance that John here attributes to Jesus a level of honor Elsewhere, given only to God. For all those who would say, Jesus never said he was God. He says it throughout all 66 books of the canon. The hairs of his head. It was blazing, white light. An image of his atoning, substitutionary sacrifice where he died for us. White wool is a clear reference to the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason or let us settle the matter. This was written seven centuries before the cross. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they're red as crimson, they shall be as wool. We'll come to this later in Revelation 7, where John wrote, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. <laughs> Can you imagine? From every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they were wearing white robes. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And then he continues, Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? Where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know, in other words, the elders saying, Who are they? And he goes, I, I don't know, but I know you do. And he said, these are those who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And then his, his eyes are like flames of fire. Fire from heaven, in, used in both in scriptures, was both purifying and consuming. In Deuteronomy 4, 24, the Lord your God is a consuming fire. In Hebrews 12, 28, 29, for our God indeed is a consuming, devouring fire fire. So these are not so much the eyes of a shepherd anymore as much as they are of a judge. The eyes John once saw in human form of a humble and suffering servant are now the terrifying eyes of the Almighty. And there will be nowhere to hide. Or, as the great theologians of Motown said, nowhere to run to, nowhere to hide. John later describes the futility of trying to hide. Look what he says in chapter 6. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, generals, the rich, everybody and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. They will see those fiery eyes. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who can withstand it? Who can hide from it? No one. So you think about those world leaders who may have a bunker. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet below the earth. Not going to help. The earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof. Oh, he'll dig you out. I promise you that. His voice was like the roar of many waters. You've been to the ocean. It's, a, it's an awesome thing. In other words, when like me and Michelle, we're, you know, and, and you, we don't live near the coast, so when you see it again, it's like, it's, it's just overwhelming. Nothing on earth dominates like the oceans. They're vast, deep, and wide. They're overpowering. They can be calm and still or tempestuous and violent. Moving on. Verse 16, in, the right hand, in his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp to its sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. These will be identified in verse 20 and then in chapter 8 and chapter 9 as seven angels who are associated with the seven churches. Again, we'll look more at that next week. 
And then he says, From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Now look at Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. What I want you to see are the two Greek words. They're not the same. They're different. So what is different about this sword that comes from the mouth of Jesus in Revelation 1, which uh, it's, it's the Greek word makeia, but then uh, the one in um, uh, Hebrews, as well as in Ephesians 6, where it talks about and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Both of those is from fire. So the word in Ephesians uh, 6 and Hebrews 4 is a saw, the smaller sword. Almost like a long knife. It's, it's easy to wield. It, 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 it protects and directs and comforts. And, and all of those things the Word of God give us. The emphasis on this sword that comes from the mouth of Jesus, judgment. We're now beyond the little sword. We're now in judgment. And so, unlike the Greek word used for the smaller sword in those two passages, the Greek word used here means large and broad. Here the word comes from Christ's mouth. The time of judgment has come. And this, this has the imagery of violent Judgment In Isaiah 11.4 it says, He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. So why from Christ's mouth? Well, look here. I just said looky. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, Lord, I apologize for that. Uh, Psalm 45.3. Gird or strap your sword. This is a messian, uh, messianic passage. Gird or strap your sword on your thigh, O mighty one. In your splendor and majesty. Now look, the place where the sword was put in Psalm 45 suggests the delay of punishment. It's still in its sheath on his thigh. It was, for it was not prepared for slaughter. Here in Revelation, the sword comes forth from the mouth. Hebrews 1.3 says, Christ sustains the universe by his word. Now he comes to destroy the unrepentant by his word. This is it, man. No more chances. Now this next one, <laughs> he said, John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. This is one of those things that, that don't ever miss God's sense of humor. Sometimes, I mean, of course, can you imagine? It's like uh, in Jonah chapter 2 verse 1, at the end of chapter 1 of Jonah, he just wants to die. And, you know, they have this huge uh, tempest, this storm, and he says, just throw me overboard. He just, Jonah, he sure doesn't want to go to um, Nineveh. He said, just throw me over. I just want to die. Well, things didn't go as he planned, and some giant fish swallowed him. The very next verse, and Jonah prayed. No kidding. Well, same thing applies here. I saw this, and I passed out. I fainted. No kidding. And Jesus laid his right hand on me saying, don't be afraid. We're going to end with that in just a moment. We're coming back. He says, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive evermore. First and last, of course, equals the Alpha and Omega. We've already seen in verse 8. Also, Revelation 21.6, I am the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and the end. Revelation 22.13, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. You see how they all mean the same thing all referring to God who is Jesus Christ. This phrase is used Alpha and Omega three times in all of Scripture, all in the book of Revelation. We move on. And the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. By the way, John, this is the Lord's day. Why do you gather on the Lord's day? Because of one thing. Because I am the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. He, in other words, he was dead and now he's alive. By, by his redeeming death and resurrection, Jesus gained authority over humanity's last enemy, which is death. We see that taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 through 26. It's interesting also because this is in the greater context of the return of Christ. Paul said, then the end will come. 
when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. I mean, it's like reading Revelation. Verse 25. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Verse 26. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. We don't have to fear death, man. We don't have to fear death. Because the best is yet to come. Jesus told the thief beside him. He said, remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. You talk about a deathbed confession. Jesus looked at him tenderly. Jesus is suffocating. He's beat almost to death. The Bible says in Isaiah, he's unrecognizable. And somehow he turns his head to that man. Just like John, he said, where it says... He placed his hand on me and said, don't be afraid. He looked at that thief. He said, don't be afraid. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. There's nothing to fear. Paul continues, listen, I tell you a mystery. We'll not all sleep. In other words, we won't all die. But we will be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable. And we will be changed. He continues, For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The wages of sin is death. And the power of the sin is the law. The law shows us our sin. It doesn't save us from it. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I was dead. I'm alive forevermore. You know, there are those. Uh, Houdini. Harry Houdini. Remember him? He died in 1926 on Halloween. So, a month and a half would be the anniversary of his death. He told his wife, Bess, I'm going to come back. I've escaped, uh, you know, he was an escape artist. I've escaped from everything else. I'm going to escape death. And so he told his wife, I want you to have seances and wait for me. And so for 10 years on Halloween, she had a seance. He even said, he said, look, you'll know it's me. Here's a code. Here's a secret code. So you'll know it's me. So if you say, hey, Harry, are you in the room? Show me. I'll give you a secret code. Well, after 10 years with no success, best stop trying. No one, no one has risen from the dead. Jesus raised a few people from the dead, but they died again. Only one is the tomb still empty, right? Hey, look, Confucius' tomb is occupied. Muhammad's tomb, occupied. Jesus' tomb, you go there today, it is empty, man. And that's what Jesus is showing John. He said, don't be afraid, John. I got this. Going on to verse 19, finishing up. Now, the command of John in 19 offers us help in understanding the entire book of Revelation. The understanding of this book is dependent on using what John is told in verse 19. He says, Write therefore the things you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. So this, provi this verse provides a simple outline for the entire book. Things you have seen is the vision in chapter 1. Things, or those that are, is the state of the church age in chapters 2 and 3. And those that are to take place, well, that's chapters 4 through 22. So it's important that we catch this because if we don't, We'll have a constant kind of garbled view of the book. So, as stated earlier, Jesus gives the meanings to what's listed in verse 20. In 1982, listen, I can't imagine this. It's beyond my um, understanding. John is the same man who walked and talked with Jesus for three years. He knows what he looks like. Now, he saw the risen Christ, and we know from Scripture that 
that often Jesus had to say, hey, it's me. But even then, even then, uh, when, he, when he comes back and, and the disciples are out fishing and Jesus is on the beach, he's making breakfast. And then he tells them, cast your net on the other side of the boat. And they go, oh my gosh, it's Jesus. Peter dives in. The rest of them, may, and they, they sit around and they, they talk with him. They, and he said, look, I'm, I'm, I have a body. Look how I eat. And John, that's the last Jesus he saw. And now he sees this. But there was no mistake as to who he was seeing. In 1982, a man named Dallas Holm, the same guy who wrote Rise Again, wrote another song. And I want you to just listen to the first verse. And he saw me. So, that last phrase that I mentioned earlier. From the Message Bible, it said, In the center, the Son of Man in a robe and a gold breastplate, hair a blizzard of white. I like that. Eye pouring fire blaze, both feet furnace fired bronze, his voice a roar, right hand holding the seven stars, his mouth a sharp, biting sword, his face a blinding sun. I saw this and fainted at his feet dead, but he placed his hand on me. Jesus speaks the word and John is non-existent but he placed his hand on me saying don't be afraid he saw me for those who have forgotten how much the Lord loves you you're going through a tough time Jesus is saying in this passage I've got this trust me I haven't gone anywhere. You're not holding me. I'm holding you. Even if you begin to ignore me and to run away, you cannot outrun my reach. The cross reaches infinitely. In fact, Jonathan Edwards, the reformer, said, God is, as it were, an infinite ocean of love, without shores, without bottom, yea, and without a surface. One author said this, he said, as Jesus hung on the cross, he was saying to a lost world, step inside out of that storm. That's what he told the thief. I got you. He said, I, I was punished that so you don't have to be. I was arrested so you could go free. I was in, indicted so you could be exonerated. I was executed so you could be acquitted. Plunge your parched soul into the sea of my love. There you will find rest, relief. And the friendship your heart longs for. As you go through a time this week, and you will, when it may be rough or tough, lonely, shame, condemnation, whatever, remember Jesus is placing his hand on you, lifting you up and saying, don't be afraid. I've got this. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much.